welcome to um, this celebration of UCL Computer Science, and actually of one individual as well, um, of Peter Kirstein. Um, so Peter not, is, is, is undoubtedly best known for his work in networking. Um, he's uh, clearly had a, a very significant impact over the years in that field. But actually also, Peter's had a major impact in computer science as a whole. So across the breadth of computer science. Com Peter founded um, the Department of Computer Science at UCL, and he founded it as a department that was focused around addressing really hard problems in scale, um, and addressing them in a way that drew on international collaboration. Now, since the time that Peter founded the department, it's grown really very significantly. We're a very large department now, um, and we're very diverse in a way that perhaps we weren't in the beginning. But we still have the same ethos, the ethos that, that started with Peter. Um, it's about addressing hard problems, drawing on international collaboration. So um, one of the things that we haven't done, perhaps as well as we should have done over the years, is celebrate our successes and do that on a regular basis. So today we are celebrating a success and this marks the beginning of a set of lectures. So one of the things that we are going to do is we're going to establish the Peter Kirstein Lectures as an annual event um, looking at not just the field of networking but across the scope of computer science, um, bringing in people from um, across the world, um, from academia, from the world of business, from alumni, from uh, colleagues who've been here for a long time, colleagues who were here and come back for these kinds of occasions, um, but also for uh, the young as well, so for the developing scientists, so for, the, uh, for, for PhD students. So in future we'll run an event um, which has a lecture associated with it, but also um, PhD program associated with it, PhD presentations associated um, with it during the day. So, again, a welcome to the events today. Um, particular welcome to Peter and Peter's family, um, friends, colleagues. Let's hear from the man himself. After I'd finished my PhD, I stayed at Stanford for another year, mainly to finish off the loose ends of my research. Then uh, I was going to go back to the States, but decided I actually rather liked Europe for a little while, and I liked skiing. So uh, I looked at various jobs, and one really appealed to me. It was to work for General Electric, in an office of three people. Uh, in those, one was in, in charge of solid state, one was in charge of chemistry, and I could cover anything else I liked, providing it was of interest in General Electric. After four years there, uh, I had to decide what I did next. Again, I considered both America and uh, both USA and UK. Uh, after looking at the various possibilities. I decided it was much more convenient to work in London but to continue on a part-time basis for General Electric, continuing the same job as I had before but a very much more part-time-ish, 
in between, I taught myself that I thought I was more interested in computers than anything else, so that uh, I would actually restrict my activities much more to computers, and in fact, much more to computer networks. And so uh, I got a position in London, in the then Institute of Computer Science, until they closed the place and I joined UCL. In order to be up to date, went and visited various parts of the US which were doing something interesting in networks and computing. One of the people I met during that time was a graduate student called Larry Roberts, who was at that stage, I think, in Lincoln Labs. Another person I met on uh, the roof at UCLA was a graduate student by the name of Vince Cerf. That must have been mid-60s mid sometime or other. I also heard about, uh, from in fact, I think from probably uh, Jerry Estrin at UCLA, that there was some project starting on networks in the US. It was being run by a company called Bolt, Brannick and Newman. And the person who was actually designing that particular network was somebody called Bob Kahn. So I talked to Bob Kahn. Uh, I talked to him quite a few times for three or four years because I was trying to get a project started. He didn't believe for one minute that I'll ever get it started because I had no money uh, from my research grants in Britain. Nobody in Britain had the slightest interest. So he did spend time with me because he's a nice person. Uh, and, but he didn't actually believe it would lead to anything. By that time, it was, that would have been probably, in the, by that time, probably 1970 or 71. But earlier, the one person who was doing superb research was Donald Davies. He wanted to build a digital network throughout Britain, which followed the digital hierarchy, which had been defined for communications over the telephone network. Unfortunately, at that particular time, the British Post Office had a complete monopoly on anything which went uh, outside a single building. They didn't want Donald to do things uh, outside the NPL, so he was never allowed to build his network. In uh, Something like 1970, the ARPANET was starting to work and was starting to work well. If you looked at the Salt Ban Treaty, there were lots of small seismic arrays. Large ones, there were only three. One was in Alaska and one was in Norway. If you look at the map, you'll see the reason for the Norwegian one was it was obviously very close to of the Soviet Union and was the only one which was that side of the Soviet Union. So DARPA put some money into that particular array getting larger. For obvious reasons, uh, it had a leased line to Washington just for seismic monitoring. Larry had the bright idea that since the ARPANET was working, and since he wanted computers on the ARPANET with applications, why not take this 2.4 kilobit line and link it to Washington? Then, uh, when he, since he knew about what was happening in London with Donald Davies, he had another good idea. Uh, the way one went between Washington and uh, that array in Norway was to take a satellite to Gunhilly and then a mixture of landlines and underwater to Norway. Well, if you're going to arrive in uh, London in, in any case, surely it must be straightforward uh, to interrupt the line, have it connect yet another machine, namely something or other, the NPL, and go on to Norway. And so why not propose that the three of them link together? You really would then have proper applications to different networks 
and really do something very, very interesting. Uh, and so he proposed that. Unfortunately, that was the time that the British were trying to get into the common market. Uh, five years earlier, they'd wanted to get to, to the other European activity which preceded the common market, and General de Gaulle said no. This time, the Heath government wanted to have Britain uh, join the common market. The reason that, Heath had said, that um, uh, de Gaulle said no was because we were too closely linked with America and too weakly linked with Europe. Therefore, the Heath decided that he did not wish to accept the offer to link to the US uh, and didn't allow Donald to, to accept the offer. Larry had met me before. He knew me. He, he knew that I knew both Europe, that particular sort of technology, knew the US, and I was the logical person to offer it next. I was interested. I'd heard about it. I would, uh, I would have loved to have working on my research in the university do it. So I said, I had no money, of course. Uh, I'd love to accept it. So he made me the offer. I then applied to money from our research councils. They thought it uh, was nonsense to do for one particular reason. Uh, for internal political reasons, uh, the ARPANET had been said to be an experiment. The people in Britain doing things didn't deal with experiments. They dealt with services. And so if this thing was an experiment, they would not back a research proposal uh, to, do, uh, to connect into it. They wanted to, only to connect into a proper service. And so they turned down the, uh, that. But Donald Davies, who did know me, uh, and who was allowed by himself to issue a, uh, a grant or contract or whatever it was for £5,000, offered me uh, £5,000 to do my research. I knew people uh, very senior in the post office and uh, they knew me and they offered to pay for a line from London, uh, UCL, or at least uh, almost you see, to Norway uh, for one year at no cost to me because the cost of a 2.5 uh, kilobit line between uh, London and Norway was way over the £5,000. Anyway, I need £5,000 for people. So they provided that line for one year. Therefore, I was able to accept the offer and uh, the project started and the rest is history. Um, hello everyone, I'm John Crowcroft. Uh, I used to work at UCL. <laughs> um, I, I, I appeared there uh, as a, an MSc student in 1980 and, uh, and then uh, somebody came uh, down to the basement where I was programming something next to a pile of LSI-11s and said, we're measuring this thing called the internet and we need somebody who can program and I hear you can program. So 
Uh, um, and so they ended up there for 20 years. Um, and um, that was around the time, just as a piece of history, and I'm going to do a segue in a second, that was around the time when the protocols that the internet ran, uh, the connection of the ARPANET, and you heard about the SatNet satellite network, um, switched from a thing called, I think it's the Network Control Program, NCP, to TCP IP. And so the first thing we did was plug in some machines to measure the internet protocol performance between London, Norway, and, and other places around Europe, in Afghan, in Germany, in Canuche, in Pisa, in Italy, and the US. And one of the weird, the good things about being at the end of this satellite network for, for a large part of the 80s was it's an incredibly high delay network. It's about 0.72 seconds up and down and up and down to go round trip time. Um, this turns out to be interesting compared with the terrestrial network. It's quite hard to make a terrestrial network take 0.72 seconds these days. Back then, it was sort of doable if you weren't very good at programming. Um, but it's very interesting for performance reasons. So this became uh, a, a topic because we were the very far end of what some people refer to as a fat pipe, uh, which is kind of bizarre. So that sounds like something you could pour lots of water down, but actually it was a very thin, long piece of string. Um, so. That was interesting for people in, uh, who wanted to see the range of performance, the scope and range of performance of communication systems. So it made, it, it made UCL a place where we could do research on networking. Um, and I mean, they had been doing research previous to that, but that was kind of a crucial factor um, in being able to collaborate with people on super fast networks that were connecting people at three megabits a second. Actually, amusingly, that was the ethernet speed around then. And we also had Cambridge rings, which were 10 megabits a second. But anyway, that's a separate piece of history I won't go into. Second thing that was interesting about that was there were multiple agencies. And you heard already about from Peter about the tension between organizations like post offices and, uh, and research in funding organizations. But uh, we also had other agencies. And the multi-agency problem led us to have to solve policy problems about how you share networks but that are funded by different agencies, which led into the whole world of policy routing, which was part of, in the early 90s, the success story of how the internet grew commercially because it allowed different ways of people to have different business relationships uh, and express controls over those. So that was actually quite important as well. Uh, well, actually, kind of fundamental. So there are two things, getting a network to perform and getting it to have many competing providers. Uh, really, we were kind of right in the middle of a lot of that and solving those problems, as well as having a bunch of very interesting applications. The other thing you could see on a couple of the pictures of the early ARPANET and connectivity is it was growing pretty fast. And um, one of the things about the internet is that the, the early designers, Bob Kahn is one of them, picked an address space, the number of bits in the address was 32 bits. This was definitely going to be enough for all time. And this is kind of like people that, you know, said, oh, well, you know, we'll have three computers or whatever a bit earlier. I think T.J. Watson said that. That would be plenty. And, and, you know, in memory address space in computers, there 16 will be okay. 32 will be okay. 64 will be okay. Um, so UCL is probably unique in academic institutions in not only running IPv4 and nowadays IPv6, but we also ran IPv5. Anyone out there know what IPv5 was also? And that's true. We ran ST. Um, and we were part of a project that ran real-time video conferencing. And people that had worked in the post office and then worked at BT Research, I hope there's nobody in the room from there who was doing this then, looks at us and said, you're running real-time video and audio over a packet switch network. That's not possible. And I would be talking to them over a video link on the internet at the time. So, you know, they were kind of, no, no, that can't be working. <laughs> but it was. So this was pretty adventurous in terms of not just having remote applications, seismic sensing, uh, or graphics to Rutherford Labs. There was a whole bunch of them. Or even being able to submit jobs to do circuit design. I think, I think was it UCLA or ISI that ran a circuit design shop? And you could send your, your things over there. And they would send you out metal boxes with things in, you know, with PCBs or whatever they were doing. Um, this was very cool. Um, so one of the things about the, the not enough address spaces, I would say that, that Peter Group, uh, before I was there, it have been running for more than 10 years at that point when I got there, which is 40 years ago, um, wrote some documents about how things should work. And, and I, I was, was talking to, uh, to Bob Kahn earlier about this because one of the documents they wrote was the Internet Ex Experimental Note 1, which uh, is quite a long time ago. It's so around the time that IP version 4 was defined. And it says it would be a good idea to have bigger addresses because then we'd be able to deal with a really big internet that's coming along. And we'll be able to cope with there'll be mobile users. There'll probably be thousands of mobile users. <laughs> so, uh, and, you know, they were right. And it's, it's, it's worth going back and looking at that document. Um, 
uh, as an interest, interesting uh, thing about identifiers, you, you can find the document. Sadly, I don't think the original source was ever electronic. It looks like it's, uh, been, it's been typed on some kind of typewriter and now it's scanned in and it's got handwriting on the version I can find that's in some of the repositories out there. So what I want to do is just to wrap up now is to go between Peter Kirstein, why am I here, and our first Peter Kirstein lecturer, um, Mark Handley, and there's a, there's a nice piece of, uh, of, 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 I think, unusual bit of history. We, I think, and Mark and I agree, are the only institution that has three generations of advisor, PhD, PhD, that all got the SITCOM award. And the SITCOM award comes from the ACM, I'm originally America, but it's an international organization of computer science, and it's the highest award for computer communications contributions to research. So, so Peter was awarded that, and I was for some bizarre reason got that, and, and Mark quite recently got that. So that is actually, and we think we're the only institution that has that. There are a couple of other sort of minor universities like UC Berkeley and MIT that have, I think, three award winners, but we don't think that, we think they're all just group, in a group together, uh, whereas we're in this, this interesting, um, uh, you know, this, there's a lineage, if you like, and that's, that's very cool. So hopefully there's somebody currently going through UCL who'll be the next one. <laughs> I mean, I can't see why not. Uh, world-class networking group at UCL. Uh, actually, there were two, which is another interesting discussion we could have. Um, okay, so, uh, so that's the last thing I wanted to say by way of introduction, except that uh, when I was mentioning the satellites uh, that we used, uh, uh, we, could, we could hear about exactly which satellite we used. It's kind of interesting bit of history, but it was a geostationary satellite, which is 35K up there, which is a very, very long way. Uh, you know, it's kind of a quarter of the way to the moon, practically. No, it's not that far. But anyway... So Mark is going to hint, uh, is going to be talking, uh, at least in part, about uh, some more recent satellites, which are a lot nearer. Um, and actually, of course, every now and then they get even nearer because they don't stay up there the whole time. So that's kind of another interesting bit of the story. So without any further ado, I'll hand over to Mark Handley. Thank you, John, for that introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, yeah, I think um, we, we observed that the Peter's Sitcom Award was in 1999, and John's was in 2009, and mine was this year. So our next one is presumably around 2029. So uh, our students have something to live up to. Um, OK, so um, I want to talk about several different themes here. Um, the, the main technical theme of what I want to talk about is resource control on the internet. And I'll go into various different technologies as we go. Um, but there are also sort of overriding themes across the sort of the technical theme. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about how hard it is to actually affect change and why most of the things I've worked on have failed. Um, I'm going to talk about the, sort of the role of academic research and, and how academia and, and industry and the real world um, can interact and actually have some, um, hopefully, uh, impact. Um, observe a little bit about some of our failures. And um, as John hinted at, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the stuff that working on right now that we don't quite know how to solve, but we have hints that we might have some ideas. Um, so before I head off into the future, this is a, a map of the ARPANET in, in 1973. And uh, I've highlighted in red over here, this is, this is London, this is Peter's contribution. Um, one thing that's a really interesting observation is, is simply how rapidly things actually um, progressed. So this is a, a diagram from a report in 1977. This is, predates my involvement in any of this. Um, and, and UCL is, is here. Um, but what this is showing in blue is the ARPANET. Um, in green is a, is a satellite network, SatNet, um, that uh, Peter and Larry and, and, um, and people were involved with. And over here in red is a packet radio network in the um, San Francisco Bay Area. And what this demonstrates is a connection that um, goes all the way across all of these networks um, to a van which was driving across the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. So as early as 1977, not only were they doing proper internet working, and this was sort of the motivation behind the original evolution of the, of the internet protocols, but they were also doing mobile networking. Um, so it's amazing how rapidly they went from not having anything to actually having all the main things that we have today. Um, so. Moving on a little bit, the first thing I want to talk about uh, here is the theme of, of congestion control. Now, if you had mentioned to me 25 years ago that we'd still be working on congestion control in 2019, I'd have thought you were nuts. Um, but it turns out we are. Um, 
So for those of you who are not well versed in, in network things, congestion control sort of comes out of an early problem with the internet. In 1988, there's a series of congestion collapse events. Now, what happens here is that you, you load the network up and it reaches a certain point, and at a certain point, it can't cope with any more packets. And so a queue overflows, packet gets lost, TCP does its nice reliable retransmission thing and retransmits packets. And all of that is good, except it's not too hard to get yourself into a situation where the retransmissions cause increased congestion, which causes increased loss, which increases the delays, and you get into this positive feedback cycle where you end up with a network running at 100% utilization and nothing useful happens. Um, so these congestion collapse um, scenarios happened in, in 1988. And the solution to this, which we're still running the, the descendants of today, um, is Van Jacobsen's congestion control algorithm. And what this does is it actually says that the end systems have to probe the load on the network. They have to increase the amount of load, the amount of traffic they have in flight on the network until they overflow a buffer, in which case now you know the network's full. And what you do is you halve the amount you send, and then you increase again, and then you halve the amount you send, and so forth. And what Van managed to show was that this stabilizes not only to a good utilization, but also to a fair share of the network. And I think it's, it's not an exaggeration to say that the internet only works over the last mumble 30, 40 years um, because Van Jacobsen congestion control does a pretty good job of matching the offered load to the available capacity. Without this, it would not have survived the evolution of the network. Now, congestion control is, is one of those things which is, is necessary but not sufficient. Um, back in, in, in 1993, uh, the web took off in, in a really big way. Actually, I, um, I ran... Um, the Tim Berners-Lee's original World Wide Web Protocol in, in 1991, um, one of my colleagues said, hey, Mark, try this out. And I ran it, and I was like, oh, what's the point of that? That'll never take off. Um, yeah, I'm not good at predicting the future. Um, but in 1993, once they added graphical uh, capability to the web, um, it took off in a huge way. This is our UCL website as of 1993 um, when, uh, when I ran it. Um, interestingly, we're still running the same web server software today on one of our servers. It must be the longest running one anywhere. Um, but the effect of this was that despite the fact that the web ran over the TCP protocol and was doing all this congestion control stuff, it still caused overload. The UK-US link was running at about 30% loss, and, uh, and that was despite the fact that congestion control was doing its job. Now, so this is where, where I come in in terms of research. Um, I started to do networking research working on one of Peter's projects, and we were working on the, on the early video conferencing uh, applications over the internet. This is a, uh, a, a screenshot from some of that where there's some video conferencing and audio conferencing and stuff going on. Some of you might recognize some of these names. Um, but it didn't really work all that brilliantly well. Uh, and the big problem we were facing um, was uh, packet loss causing uh, audio to break up. And so one of the projects that Peter uh, initiated was, was a, a way to actually deal with this. And so what we did was we developed a concept of redundant encoding. So these are packets. And, and normally, um, you, you have your header on your packet, and you have some audio data in them. And if you lose a packet, then you lose the audio, and you get glitchy sound, and it sounds really quite terrible. Um, the very, very simple innovation that, that our, our project came up with was to actually add a redundant encoding to this. So you take a copy of the, the audio from packet three here, you compress it a bunch more, and you stick it one packet behind. It's a really, really simple concept. Um, but what happens is that when you lose a packet then, you can still actually recover the audio data from that. It's a little bit lower quality, but it's still much, much better than having a gap in this. And so this was um, a simple innovation, but actually it turns out to make a huge difference. And we, we standardized this in, in 1997, which took a few years to get through the standardization process, like most of these things do. Um, and this is basically still what's done today when it comes to how you transfer audio across the internet. You use redundant encoding like this. If you use Skype or anything like that, it's doing stuff like this. Um, so that was great. We, we actually um, solved the problem, made packet audio really robust, and things were working um, somewhat better. Um, if we roll forward a few more years, though, um, now it's the turn of video. Uh, cheap USB cameras um, came around towards the end of the 1990s and suddenly everybody was wanting to play with video. And for audio, it didn't really matter. The audio was just not that big a data rate. It was not causing any major problems on the network, but video is a different deal. Video uses a lot of data. And so the question that came up was, how are we gonna do video congestion control? 
doesn't make any sense to do the same stuff as TCP because you know that's changing its data rate all over the show and you really don't want your video quality going up and down, up and down several times a second. Um, it looks terrible. So how do you do video congestion control? Well, we, we looked at sort of, well, what's the goals here? The goals are we need to be able to compete with TCP traffic for those queues in the, in the network. Um, but you're pretty constrained by the fact that you have to compete with it. Um, if you live down in, in this side, this is the TCP rate and this is the video rate, um, your video quality is going to be terrible, it's going to be undeployable. And if you live in that corner, um, it's unstandardizable. Nobody will let you standardize that because you're going to kill all the existing web traffic. And so you're really forced to live somewhere in the middle there, um, which goes by the so-so name of TCP friendly, um, where you're sort of compatible. But we can't do the same thing that TCP is doing. Uh, and so the question is, how do you make that work? And the breakthrough came from a, a, a friend of mine, Jitendra Padhe, who came up with a really good model for how TCP behaved as a function of loss rate and round trip times and so forth. And so what we did was we took his model and we embedded it in a rate control scheme so that we tried to actually model the, the medium term throughput of TCP without having to be massively variable like TCP was. And so that's the equation they came up with. I'm not going to go through it. And this basically shows this is data rate that TCP does over time, and this is the data rate that our TCP compatible traffic would do over time, competing in the same queues. And so this is cool. Um, it took us a long time to actually get the details right. So the, the principle was easy, but the details are always where the pain is. Um, but this worked, and we, got it, we published this in, in SIGCOM in 2000, and we were all really happy. Um, and then we took it to the IETF, and the IETF thought that was a great idea. And, put it through working groups and we standardized it and we came out the other end with an RFC and it's like, yes, we've not only got our paper, but we've also got the standard. Surely now we're going to change the world. Mm, doesn't necessarily work that way though, does it? Um, so several of us went on, on a sort of a, a, a kind of a world tour. We went and talked to everybody who was doing video conferencing software and said, so how about you implement this? We, we've got all these demonstrations that it works well. And what we got back was responses for well, what's in it for me? I mean, I just get to go slower, and it's going to annoy my users. Or, but I can just add all this redundancy and forward error correction you told me about, and that'll protect my photos from packet loss. So I don't need to do that stuff. Um, this is one of those ones where you go, ha, huh, yeah, maybe we were too successful. Um, and then sort of comment, I don't adapt my rate. All those nice TCP flows will adapt, and they'll get out of my way. So I don't need to adapt. Um, and then the other one, implement congestion controls is hard, and it won't make me any more money. Whereas there's other things I could do that would make me money, so I'm not going to invest that engineering time. So we made this observation, which was that TCP is used by everyone because it's ubiquitous. It's in your operating system. So you don't need to implement your own protocol. It's just dead easy to sort of get up there and actually use the thing. Um, can we actually make this kind of congestion control stuff be ubiquitous for the sort of traffic we want to do for, for audio and video, for, for this unreliable datagram-based content. And so we went back to the drawing board and drew up a protocol design and went through multiple designs of it. And, um, and so what we wanted to do, we wanted to handle connection setup, we wanted to negotiate parameters, but mostly we wanted to implement a form of congestion control that's suitable for your multimedia traffic. And so we, we figured out how to do that. It turns out to actually, again, not be all that easy, but we, we managed to do that. We got another SIGCOM paper out of it, which is great. We like SIGCOM papers. Um, we took it to the IETF. We formed a working group. We battled through two and a half years of working group, came out the other side with an RFC. We implemented it in Linux. We even got it uplined to the mainline Linux kernel. It's in every Linux system that is around. I even wrote a formal proof of the state machine, and it works great and no one uses it. <laughs> um, that's a bit of a disappointment. <laughs> um, so we did pretty much everything right, but, but why does nobody use it? Um, well, it turns out that there's something of a chicken and egg problem when you do anything new, especially in the field of networking, although the problem is more broad, which is that unless you can count on it being everywhere, you can't actually count on using it. And therefore, you'd also have to roll back a fallback plan for when it's not there. And if the fallback plan works fine, then you can't count on being there. Um, now, we got it in the Linux kernel, which means it got lots of places, but it didn't get into Windows, at least not early enough. Um, 
and it didn't get into people's firewalls, which was the problem. It's very, very minor tweak to add it to a firewall. Very minor. It's like about two lines of code. Um, but it was not there. And that was what essentially doomed this. We could not get it widely deployed because you can't get everybody to change simultaneously. And that's tricky. And so this is a problem that we face again and again when we're trying to actually innovate in the field of networking. So back to the drawing board. Um, one of the problems here is that there are some reasonable benefits from using something like DCCP, but the benefits don't necessarily outweigh the cost. Um, if you're going to have to get people to change lots of places, why don't we see if we can get more benefit and do something more radical? Um, and so um, I was out at, at Berkeley at uh, this time, and um, I had a, a really smart uh, summer intern called Dina Katabi. Um, who, who came along and, and, I, and I, I set her a challenge. I said, what if we could do congestion control from clean slate? What if we could put any signaling bits you want in the packets whatsoever, but one caveat, you don't keep any per flow information in the routers because that would be difficult to make it scale. How would you use those bits? And we went through a lot of iterations on this and Dina is just really, really, really smart. She's now a professor at MIT. Um, and she came back with a really nice solution. Um, Roughly speaking, what happens is the sender tells the network what the network round trip time is, what the delay is, because that's the control constant for a control loop. You need to know the latencies. Um, and it also says how many packets it wants to send in the next round trip time. And the routers use that. They read the information. They use it to modify their internal state. Um, and then they use it to predict what the load's going to be and therefore control the demand. And they can do it in a way which is not only good utilization, but also is fair, which is important. And so the sender says, my round trip time is whatever, 100 milliseconds, and I want to send 50 packets next time in that 100 milliseconds. And that goes across the network. And at some point, you hit a link which is going to be congested. And so the router reduces the demand and says, you can't do that. You can only do Y. And the receiver feeds that back. And, and everything next time around, the sender is allowed to send Y. The concept's really simple. The details, again, of the controls loop to make this work uh, are where Dina's innovation was. And so, again, this, um, this works really well. This top graph shows different flows starting at different times, and what you see is that they convert really rapidly to a nice fair share of the network. Um, the middle graph shows that the network utilization at the bottleneck, it just pretty much hovers around 100%. And the graph down here shows how big the queue is. It occasionally peaks at about four packets, which is ridiculously small. Um, so this works really well. It converges very rapidly towards fairness. It doesn't build large queues, so the delay is very low. It's very, very nice. Um, and so we got this in a SIGCOM paper too, but then we, more importantly, we went and talked to various different companies and we had a big um, discussion with Cisco about implementing this. And, and Cisco actually went through building an implementation they tried it out and they concluded it worked very well as well in their implementation. Um, but the same chicken and egg problem comes along. Um, it's actually really quite hard to deploy in the real world. Um, you really need to make sure that you have one of these routers at the bottleneck. Otherwise, you're going to um, change your rate um, at, um, or, and unrealistically, optimistically in certain cases. Um, and so despite the fact that the benefits now for this are much bigger than what we saw with other stuff, it still doesn't come out on, on the plus side of that cost-benefit trade-off. And in the end, although this has actually influenced an awful lot of research since then, it hasn't influenced an awful lot of stuff that actually deployed in the real world. So this is another one of my failures. Uh, so there's some lessons here. Um, the first lesson is change is really hard. Um, everybody involved in implementing or deploying a change needs to have a motivation for it. And unless you actually try to figure out oh, where, does everybody involved have a sufficient economic motivation, you're probably not going to get there. Um, and that's one of these things, we may be good technical researchers, but we're not necessarily economists. But you have to actually start to think about what's the, what's the economics to before you actually have some chance with technology making it. Now, I'm going to come back to this later because it turns out that some of these techniques actually may have uses now that we didn't predict then. Um, and so sometimes these, these things that, we, that are cutting edge research but don't make it actually turn out to have potentially great influence later on. Um, so we'll come back to that one. Um, but there's another lesson which is also interesting, which is that even the best congestion control schemes can't actually solve congestion. Uh, now, we sort of saw this in 1993 with the web congesting the, the American link. Um, but just to sort of 
prove to you that what I'm talking about here. Consider what happens if you got an, if, as you increase the arrival rate of fixed size flows. Okay. Now congestion control is going to do its job, but the arrival rate of flows increases. So ideally, you'd like the, the this is the connection arrival rate, this is the connection completion rate, and ideally you'd like to be on that line. And indeed you are on that line up until the point when the network gets full. And after that point, it just crashes. Uh, if the arrival rate of flows is faster than you can actually have the flows finish, then all of these flows time out and none of them finish, which is an interesting thing. Congestion control doesn't solve congestion. Um, it does space things out over more time, but it can't actually solve it if there isn't something else going on. And so the high-level observation here is that sometimes the internet only functions because there's some external control loop going on, and that must reduce application demand. So this is your normal sort of TCP control loop that matches um, supply to demand. And typically, we'll embed that into a protocol like, uh, like HTTP for the web. Um, and what I'm saying is this only works because you've got an external control loop like that in yellow. So what's that? Well, typically for the web, it's the re user reads the web page. And the human is the control loop. Because if the web page doesn't allow a node, you can't read the next one, so you can't click on the link. And there is an external control loop, it's just not a technical one. Um, it turns out that there's actually more than one form of this sort of control loop. And if we don't pay attention to these, we, don't, we actually have a good idea of what's really going on on, on the network. So another way we do this is, again, we're still using the same protocol, we're using HTTP over TCP, um, but now we've got multiple possibilities. So you, you make a, a connection, you download some data, you measure how fast it's going, and then you may choose to download from more than one place or more than one quality. Um, so, for example, you might choose to download a high quality version of some content or a low quality version of some content. So where do we use this? Well, this is what Netflix uses and all the other video streaming. Um, it, there's this external control loop going on all the time, trying to figure out what, whether to download the large file, which is high quality, or the small file for the same bit of video, which is low quality. And this external loop is not only what makes sure that your, your video, in, um, when you're watching um, uh, whatever it is you're watching on Netflix, um, is working, um, but also this is actually, this external loop is realistically what is keeping the internet stable today with all the huge amounts of video on it. It's not TCP's control loop in the middle, it's this external loop that's, what, that's making things work. Um, and then you can sort of do this and you can say, well, okay, um, you can also do this across, not over quality, but across location. So you might fetch some stuff from a London server or something from a Paris server, um, and this will, will allow you to, to figure out which parts of the network are less congested, which path is working. Um, and so, again, this is also what's used when you're doing video streaming to some degree, but it's also what things like BitTorrent do. They fetch from different, um, uh, different servers. And so now what we're doing is our external loop is not only avoiding overload, but it's doing something else. It's actually balancing traffic across different parts of the internet. It's load balancing across different paths in the network, which is very interesting now. That's like we're getting a different form of, of control loop going on here, and that, and that balances the hotspots. If, if the network in London is running really busy today because something failed, we can offload traffic there elsewhere. And that's very different from spreading it out in time more. Okay, so that's, we're now starting to look at sort of not just how much traffic along one path, but what path. Um, so this is a, a slightly more recent map of the internet than the one I showed at the start. Um, it turns out there is no really recent one. This one is probably still about 20 years old. Um, but it's the most recent one that has any real degree of completion to it, and it's pretty, so I'm using it. Um, so suppose you want to go from here to there across the internet. Um, routing is what chooses what path you take. Um, we can argue about how the routing is done, but the routing system, the routers, the switchers decide what path you're taking through the network, and then your end system gets to, do it, gets to live with it. Now, of course, this is all dynamic. If you get a failure, then your routing system will, will explore different possible paths, and hopefully it will eventually reconverge on something that actually works. Sometimes that takes longer than we'd like, but it will reconverge usually on something that works. But there's a disconnect here. The disconnect is that the routing is choosing a path for your traffic, but the routing is not paying attention to whether that path is a congested path, um, at least uh, the first, uh, first So if you've got a congested link here, the routing doesn't know about it because the routing doesn't know what the 
goal of the thing is, the, all the routing is really carried by is, is there a working path? Preferably one that is cheap. So this then takes us sort of back to this question of, if we think about these external controls, how do we load balance the stuff? Um, the computers on the internet these days are not like they were in the 1970s. They are not the size of a room with a network interface card the size of a fridge. They fit in your pocket and they have multiple network cards in them. And so your, your phone has Wi-Fi, it has 4G, maybe if you're lucky it has 5G, um, but it has multiple network interfaces. And so all of these protocols that we use, which were designed in, uh, from the origin of the internet, would, would assume that computers weren't mobile and only had one connection, but they don't. And so the question is, can we actually take advantage of this? Can we actually use multiple network interfaces better than just saying, is my Wi-Fi up? No, okay, I'll use 4G, um, which is what most of them do. So what we'd really like is your phone to connect via 4G, and as you wander around, you come in range of a Wi-Fi base station and you associate with it, and that connection that's already happening in red establishes an additional connection, and it uses both of them whichever one's working better. And as you move, it can connect kind of maybe another Wi-Fi base station, you can add that one too. And so we can be streaming a single connection from multiple places. And as you come out of range, they come and go. This is a sort of dynamic behavior that we'd really like to have. Um, and we don't have because the network protocols were designed in the era where computers were the size of rooms. Um, so what can we do about that? It turns out that these sort of three things I've just talked about, the, the balancing between the London server and the Paris server, the multiple network interfaces, uh, and so forth, all of them actually are linked by some really interesting theory that came from um, uh, Frank Kelly and Peter Key, um, which is um, basically says if you simultaneously send across more than one path, um, you can actually use the end systems to load balance all the links within a network, so long as there's a, enough diversity. Um, and the way you do this is by your, your multipath flow here, measuring the level of congestion and moving traffic actively away from the more congested paths onto the less congested path. And you can use this to, to balance the traffic across a network. It's a really interesting observation that the end systems can actually do this job of, of totally low balancing your network. When the routing system, it's quite difficult to make it work. I mean, load dependent routing is kind of the holy grail of routing since the start of the internet. Um, but the end systems can do it. Um, and so we sort of we came across this observation and, and thought, huh, we can just build that. Let's just do it. Um, and so this took us into trying to design um, an extension to the TCP protocol called Multipath TCP. And um, it turns out that actually it's really hard. Um, how to move traffic from the more congested paths to the less congested while always performing at least as well as a single path TCP on the best of those possible paths not beating up TCP when it turns out that all of your multiple flows actually get funneled through the same pipe, um, and being stable when the paths actually converge. This combination of things is really difficult. Um, it turns out that the original theory works really well in theory and doesn't work well in practice. Um, unfortunately, that's often the case. Um, so it took us about two and a half years to figure out what the question was and about a month to answer it. Um, Sometimes that's the way things are. If you act, once you actually figure out what the question is, then, then the solutions sort of present themselves. So we thought the hard part was getting all the dynamics right to make all this stuff work. Um, and so once we'd figured out that, we went to the IETF and said, we'd like to standardize this stuff. And the IETF said, oh yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Uh, and the protocol should be really easy, shouldn't it? We just add a few options and we're fine. Um, but we've been burned here before. Remember DCCP, which we couldn't get deployed? Well, we were bit more careful this time because, well, failure always hurts. Um, so we actually went and did a meta measurement study and tried to figure out what will actually work across the internet. And so we ran probes from 124 networks in 24 different countries just testing out. If you do things slightly out of the normal in TCP, what happens? Now, of course, if you have done a sort of networking 101 class, you will be of the illusion that you send a packet in and the packet comes out the other side. Um, and sometimes it gets lost and sometimes it gets duplicated, but that's all that happens. Well, that's a nice fiction we tell our students. 
Um, in reality, there's all sorts of boxes in the middle of the network that people put there for their own reasons. There's firewalls, there's all sorts of performance enhancing proxies. Um, there's all sorts of stuff in the middle of the network, which is not really supposed to look at inside the packet, but does. And so it turns out that this was, there was sufficiently interesting stuff that we ended up writing a, a whole paper on it. But what we found shocked us and it shocked everybody I showed it to. Um, unknown TCP options, were often removed, or you know, the packet was modified and they were removed, or the packet was just blocked. Um, TCP sequence numbers got rewritten in the middle of the network. Um, turns out there's a paper I wrote a long time back about doing some security that actually motivated people to do that, so I'm my own problem there. Um, anyway, um, TCP packets that you sent two packets, you got one, or you sent one packet, you got two. Um, sequence numbers, if you, if you left a gap in the sequence space, some Sometimes the connection would just stall for no good reason because some box in the middle of the network thought, oh, TCP is reliable, it'll eventually see everything, and didn't. And, and then if you send a packet with a particular sequence number with one kind of content and then you send a retransmission of the same packet with different content, the network would fix it. I wanted different content, thank you, but no, couldn't do it. Um, so it turns out that so many paths mess with this stuff um, that you actually can't just do the nice simple deployment. The dynamics turned out to be the easy part, despite the fact it took us several years. And the hard part was actually just trying to think of what would work on the internet today, which is such a mess. Um, so eventually we figured out what would work. Um, and so this is, uh, Multipath TCP is now um, uh, RFC, it's uh, gone through the standards process and turned out the other side. And, um, Almost all of the complexity in the protocol comes from fallback strategies. It's how to cope with what the network does to you when the network really shouldn't be messing with stuff in the first place. Um, but this one actually succeeds. Well, sort of succeeds. Um, Multipath TCP is now deployed in, in iOS and in macOS, and every time you talk to Siri, it uses Multipath TCP to get nice low latency. Um, how useful Siri is is a different question, but... Um, some Android variants, especially in Korea, also do this, and it's still not quite shipping in the Linux mainline kernel because the Linux folks don't really quite like it when you come to them with a 100,000 line diff. Um, but it is eventually going to get there. Um, perhaps even more interestingly, TCP for the web is starting to be re replaced by a, a protocol called QUIC, um, which uh, came originally out of Google, but then through the, the IETF, and, and QUIC is encrypted. So, um, one of the cool things about the fact that if you encrypt everything by default from that is that people in the middle can't mess with your traffic. You know, it's encrypted so they can't see what's in there. Um, and so actually now um, a multipath version of QUIC is being worked on the IETF and, um, and that's based on the lessons we learned on, on MPTCP congestion control. But they don't have to do the stupid stuff to work around what the middle does because the middle can't they mess with encrypted traffic. So does, if we sort of stop and sort of step back from the technology a minute, um, before the internet, before the 1970s, they sort of the, if you looked at any form of communication, it was all about circuits. Um, sort of, if they were very innovative, they might be virtual circuits, but you divided up a, a, a network pipe into, into slices and each of you got a slice. The big innovation of the internet was statistically multiplexed um, connections because computer communications are bursty. They're not like a phone call that they're continuous. They're really bursty. And, and if you have very bursty sources and you do this to them, it all works really rather badly. Um, if you have bursty sources and you statistically multiplex them, you get much better use of your network than you could ever possibly get from virtual circuits. What we're seeing now is that with these multipath protocols trying to balance traffic actively between paths, we're moving towards an evolved internet where, we, where the, the individual paths are all part of a resource pool. And so you can actually slide traffic around back and forth between different paths. And, and this gives you potentially much more resilience and much better performance. Um, to be honest, I don't care that much about the, uh, the performance. I care much more about the fact that the network is resilient when you do this. And so the, the network is very good at coping with the fact that you know, there's a hotspot developed in one place. It can spread the traffic out and avoid that. So that's where I think the internet is going in that sort of big picture point of view. So what, why does that work? Um, what I show here, this is a diagram from, from Damon Wishick, who worked with us on this. Um, this shows three multipath flows going through four network pipes. And so they're spreading the traffic out so that in the end they've shared out these different pipes equally. Well, that's, that's fine. We, 
they're all equal. But what happens if somebody takes up a lot of the capacity on the top link? So the available capacity is much smaller. Well, what happens is that the top connection here detects congestion and actively moves traffic on it, which moves it onto here, which pushes harder on this pipe, which squeezes this one, which moves traffic off here, which moves right down here, which squeezes on this one, which moves traffic off there and onto the bottom. And after you've finished, they've low bounced the network again. So stuff that was up here caused an impact down here, but you've spread the traffic out across the network and it's much better balanced than it was. And this is a really nice observation that you can pool a whole network like this. Okay, so multipath end systems seem like a really cool idea. Um, who gets to pick the paths? The routing system is still picking the path. With multipath TCP as it is at the moment, you rely on the fact that your Wi-Fi provider and your 4G provider are probably not the same company and they end up with probably different paths. But that's not very good. Um, we would like that to be much more flexible, but we're not there yet. Um, turns out there is one place, though, where we get a lot more control of that, and that's in the data center. Data center networking is a huge deal these days. Um, it's been sort of one of the hot topics of networking for the last decade or so. Um, this is a, a nice, pretty, moody picture of one of Google's data centers. I bet that lighting is not there every day. Um, but that's, that's a data center with lots and lots and lots of, of racks in lots and lots and lots of rows and so on. But if you look at it from a logical point of view, the topology tends to look something like this. This is a cross topology, where you have the servers at the bottom, and then you have tiers of switches. And the, what you're doing is then doing valiant load balancing, sort of random load balancing, to hash flows to paths across the network. And what this lets you do is have any machine in the network talk to any other machine. So lots of paths there, lots of possible ways that you could send your traffic. Which one are we going to pick? Well, if we've got something like multipath TCP, how about all of them? Um, seems like a good idea to me. Um, so this is a, a three-dimensional representation of that same network topology. And, and what you can observe is that if we pick sources to send to destinations, we can have somebody send to somebody else. And so long as you pick the path sensibly, everybody can send to somebody else at full rate in this kind of topology. So that's great. Um, the problem comes when you don't spread the traffic properly across the whole network. And so you end up with these flow collisions within the network, and you end up with congestion, despite the fact that there's enough capacity in this network. Of course, if we actually spread our traffic out, if we spray our traffic across many paths, and we can do it evenly, then we don't have a problem with that anymore. So it's a really nice fit to do multipath across these networks, um, because they inherently have a lot of paths, and we, just by doing multipath by itself, we solve an awful lot of problems. We don't solve all of the problems, but we solve quite a lot. Now, the one remaining big problem, if you spread out of that, is the fact that sometimes many people want to talk to one place. Um, this is called in-cast, where lots of people are sending to the same destination. It happens a lot in a data center where you farm work out to a lot of servers and then they all reply to you at the same time. Um, so realistically, what we want to be able to do is to cope with that, and that's where the congestion control part of multipath TCP can kick in. Um, but the, the spreading the traffic across all the paths seems like a really good fit. And so we ran experiments with this. We deployed multipath TCP in one of Anna's, Amazon's data centers. And um, this graph is basically just by the flow rank. We did all pairs between uh, 40 nodes in Amazon. And that stuff on the right there, you could ignore because they're in the same uh, rack. So there's no possibility of using multiple paths. But for the rest of it, um, we showed that by moving from using one path to the network to two paths to the network to four paths to the network, you can get substantially better throughput in their network, which is great. In, in the real world, this works. Um, so why isn't everybody using it? Um, it does work really well. It solves the problem we thought we had. Um, but it's not the right problem. Bandwidth in data centers is not really the big problem people care about. In data centers, people really care about latency. Um, we thought that, well, we have this nice hammer that looks like a really good nail. Um, but actually, it's not about the bandwidth. Still, the concept of multipath is right, but the taking a protocol design for the wide area internet and stuffing it into a data center where the delays are very small was not really the right thing to do. Solved the wrong problem a few times in my life. <laughs> um, so latency is the goal. Latency, latency, latency. Um, there's lots of things you would like out of a data center network. I'm not going to go through all of these in detail, but the first thing you really want is low latency because a lot of stuff in data centers is request response, and you really care about getting a response very fast. And the second thing you care about is that when you send stuff out to lots of servers, some of them are always a bit slow in responding. 
And so you really, 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 really care about getting the answer from the ones who are slow responding. So you need to be able to prioritize. And only the receiver knows where the important traffic is. Um, and then the third thing you want, which is secondary to the rest, is predictable high throughput. But that's not the main thing you care about. You care about these other things first. And when you actually stop to think about this carefully, you realize pretty fundamentally that packet loss as a congestion signal is a really not a very good idea for this. And, and even more so, even if you implement things like explicit congestion notification, which gives you a signal as queues start to build, you're still too late. You let the queue build. Um, so these, the traditional ways we manage net traffic, traffic through these networks just are not a good match for what the requirements are. So what this shows is, is our solution to this. Um, these are packets coming into a switch, and we're running a really tiny queue in this switch, eight packets, which means that we overload this every now and then. And so what we do instead of dropping the packets is to slice the header off. See, those are, these are headers getting sliced off and put it in here. Now, you would think that's a bad idea, slice the header off, and we also put them in a priority queue, so those headers we slice off get there first. Now, why would you do that? Well, the first thing is, if you're going to run very small queues, you are going to overflow them, for sure. There's nothing you can do about it. You're going to overflow the queues, but we need to run very short queues to guarantee the latency is low. Um, now, why do we trim off the headers and forward the headers with priority? Well, the reason we do that is because we want the receiver to know exactly what happened. Not knowing that something was sent means you can't deal with it quickly, but if you know it was sent, you can request a retransmission really fast. So at the receiver, this traffic is coming in, a line rate coming into the receiver, and what we want is the receiver to completely manage its own uh, downlink. And so each packet that comes in, we queue a, essentially a request to go back for more traffic. But what we also get when things get busy is we get these headers coming in that were trimmed. And so now our receiver can build up a queue of these, and it can figure out how to manage this queue. There are several things it wants to do. The first thing is it wants to send out these requests for more traffic at exactly the rate the traffic comes in, so it can not cause congestion. But the second thing it wants to do is to make sure that it pulls the thing that matters to it most. And this is why you want to trim off the headers and send them to the receiver, because it lets the receiver choose. The receiver can say, I care a lot about that flow. I don't care about that flow. I know I've got a lot of pull packets from you, and I'm going to pull that one, because I care about that one. And this gives you a really beautiful way for the receiver to control the, 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 which sources send to it um, right down at the packet level. So, so this was a, a, a protocol we designed, um, which stands for NDP, which is the poor acronym for New Data Center Protocol, but whatever, um, which basically sprays traffic across all the paths in a network. Um, and the, the nice thing about doing this across something like a cross topology, if you do per packet multipath spraying across all the packets, is you load balance the core of the network beautifully. There's no congestion you can build in the core of the network because there isn't any way to congest the core of the network if you spray beautifully. Um, so that gives us this low, low latency, uncongested core. And now we really care now about what happens when multiple people try to send to the same place at once. And that's where this idea of trimming off just the headers and forwarding them comes in. Um, it gives the receiver full information as to what's going on. So the receiver can pick what it receives. And after that burst of traffic, it can pace it perfectly so things don't get trimmed after the first burst. And so this means you have to re-architect the transport protocol. You have to, you have to change the switches. Um, but if you do all of this, you can have a network which has very low latency and the receivers can pick what's going on and so on. And it works really nicely. Um, I'm going to say it's not deployed, aren't I? Um, <laughs> uh, obviously, this is difficult to deploy, but it's one of those ones where the benefits, again, are really big. Um, the difference with the data center versus the internet is there's fewer people you need to convince. Um, typically, data centers are run by one organization. They might have tenants, but the actual physical data center is run by one organization. So you only really have to convince one customer. Now, you also have to convince the vendors, the people who make the switches and the people who make the network interface cards, because they need to change stuff. Um, the jury's still out on this one. Um, we're actively dealing with two of the largest switch and NIC interface card silicon vendors in the world. I can't say which, but you can probably guess who. Um, and they're, they're actually deploying, well, they're experimenting with this in switch silicon as we speak. So maybe this will actually make it out there into the real world. It's certainly fairly radical, um, but the benefits are really big. So we'll see. We don't really know, but at least this one is not impossible. Um, and it's because it's that, that limited environment where you can actually then um, don't have quite such a chicken and egg problem as elsewhere. But let's go back to this question I asked a minute ago. Who picks the paths? Oops. Um, 
What about on the internet? Well, if we look at traditional routing on the internet, you have protocols like BGP and OSPF and so forth, and they, they basically are there to make sure that you have connectivity. Um, this is sort of the, the view of networking as of about 15 years ago. It doesn't look that way anymore. Um, the line between traffic engineering and, and routing has narrowed uh, increasingly. I mean, for, for decades, ISPs have, have tweaked the metrics in the routing protocols to balance traffic. Um, more recently, things like MPLS traffic engineering has become um, very commonplace to try and do some automated traffic management. And even more recently still, networks like Microsoft's internal network and Google's internal network um, are, are using uh, techniques called software-defined networking to actually be able to do much more active management of the traffic across their networks. Um, this stuff is not rolling out across the internet yet, but there's a proof of concept that at least in some places this stuff can work really well. Now, we started to say, well, can you, could you do stuff on the internet? And we thought that it was fairly well understood about network topologies and routing and things like that. We thought these problems were mostly understood sometime in the early 1990s at the latest and probably before then. Um, what we've discovered is that actually if you're trying to design a network topology to support low latency, um, then actually it's quite hard to actually use that topology, which is an interesting observation. So what do I mean by designing a topology for low latency? It's got to have pretty direct paths to anywhere you want to go. Um, but it's also got to have some measure of redundancy because if you're going to load up the best path and it gets full, you need to be able to offload traffic. And so if you're designing a network for low latency in today's world, it's got to have redundant low latency paths. And so this graph shows um, 100 and something networks. These are real network topologies. And what we show on here is the, if when you load them up under moderate load, it's not really, really high load, but it's moderate load. The network's running you know, 40 or so percent utilization on average. Um, this shows how congested their networks are. Um, and the interesting observation is that you know, things down here are, are good. You know, maybe you have a few links that are congested. But up here, the blue is the median link is congested. And so this is, as far as we can see, Google's network is the best network any ISP has deployed for doing low latency multipath. And we try to do it with a, a single, simple shortest path routing protocol, and it causes massive congestion. You can't operate those networks unless the routing system itself is managing traffic and actively moving traffic around. And the better the network you build from the point of view of latency, the worse this problem becomes. And it's interesting because this seems like something that's some obvious and fundamental, but nobody had described it. Um, we, we, we tried to find information on this anyway, and nobody had discussed this phenomena. Um, so we ended up with a SIGCOM paper from that, which was nice. But, um, but it's an interesting observation that seems so simple and obvious with hindsight, but it wasn't obvious. Um, so what are we trying to do here? We're trying to build networks. We now have low latency. We care a lot about latency in the internet. Um, we're trying to build topologies which are robust so they'll still work. Um, when, you, when you load them up. So we need to have a resilient topology so that when you've loaded the best path, there are other paths that still make sense. Um, we need the topology to have pretty direct paths when you physically build the network. Um, and then you need to have a routing system that doesn't create hotspots. So how do we do that? Well, there's only really two ways we know how to do that. You either have to have load-dependent routing, and distributed load-dependent routing is not a solved problem. Um, it may not be a solvable problem, but it's certainly not a solved problem. Uh, centralized load dependent routing is what people like Google do internally. They have central root computation, um, which sort of makes sense within one network, but probably doesn't make sense between different networks that don't trust each other. Um, or you've got to present multiple paths to a multipath transport, which can balance it for you, or you want to do a combination of both. So this is where we currently are in terms of where the state of the art is in terms of the balance between from gesture control and routing and so forth in the internet. Have you guys seen this? This is my simulations of SpaceX's uh, proposed Starlink network. This is only the first phase of it. You know, that's, um, this is showing around 1,500 satellites. And the idea is that they'll have, uh, these satellites are in low Earth orbit, about 550 kilometers up, and they'll have free space lasers between the satellites. And so you'll be able to bounce up from the ground here in London to a satellite overhead, go laser, 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 and come back down again. 
So why would you want to do this? Um, those numbers up there are why you'd want to do this. Um, it's because you get the speed of light in a vacuum. And the speed of light in a vacuum is about one and a half times faster than the speed of light in glass. And so you get very good low latency if you build a network like this. And so SpaceX um, launched their second 60 satellites um, on Monday. Um, they're currently in orbit and slowly progressing their way towards where they will be. Um, and so this is the future of wide area low latency networking. I mean, assuming they can actually make it work. Um, now, there's some challenges here. You know, the big benefit from building such a network like this with thousands of satellites is that you get low latency. You also get to connect to weird places in sort of like the mountains of Montana and places like that. Um, but the, the, from a network point of view, the biggest benefit is this wide area latency. The problem is the best path changes every few seconds because the network is moving. The satellites are moving overhead. Um, and you're going to have to run this network at pretty high utilization to make the economics work. Launching thousands of satellites is not cheap, even for SpaceX. Um, so this is a very meshy network. Lots of different possible paths. But what did we learn from experimenting on the internet? That meshy networks create hotspots. And so you need a very active way of managing traffic to do this. Except this is much harder because the paths are changing every few seconds too. So we're going to have to have a case. We, we, we think we know how to actually route stuff if you don't care about congestion. That stuff we can do. But the problem is that if I have a lot of traffic on one laser link and I need to move it across to the next laser link across, I need to make sure the traffic that was on that laser link is gone before the traffic gets there. And that kind of coordination, how do I move things between different possible links on a matter of no more than a second um, while running everything at high utilization? That's a really interesting, difficult problem. It turns out, though, that if you run a control loop across this, you can actually start to figure out when it's acceptable to admit traffic onto a new path. Um, and there are control loops that people have devised in the path that might work for this. Um, remember this protocol XCP that Dina Katabi and I did? Um, well, that turns out to be a really good mechanism for only admitting traffic onto a path when that path actually has capacity for it. Um, and so it looks like if you do a combination of source-based routing from the, from the ground station and a control loop like that so that it can move traffic over a course of half a second or so between one path and the next one, um, you might actually be able to make this work. So it's one of the really interesting observations that we thought XCP was dead. It was a cool idea. It got a paper, but it never went anywhere. Um, sometimes those old ideas actually turn out to be really useful, and this looks like being one of those cases. Now, what I just showed you was only phase one of Starlink. This is, is what it will look like if they actually launch phase two, phase three, and phase four, um, which is about 12,000 satellites in low Earth orbit. Um, that's going to be a really interesting challenge to, to make that uh, work from the point of view of, of loading that up. And is it not yet a solved problem? We don't think SpaceX know how to do this. Um, they're certainly not saying that they know how to do it, but we don't think they know how to do that. We think that it will work fine as long as they run it at lowest utilization, but as soon as it gets loaded heavily, they will start to run into the problems that we're seeing in simulation. So how do we manage traffic in such a rapidly changing, dense network to keep the low latency properties but also get good throughput? Um, that's currently beyond the state of the art. Um, we have some ideas, but it is not a solved problem at this point. Um, so that really is right now where the frontier of networking research is, literally, to go where no one's gone before. <laughs> um, OK. so. Thank you very much for coming here. This work is obviously work with many, many, many collaborators. I hope I haven't missed any off the list here, but uh, this list of many of the people that I've collaborated with over the years and who have influenced me and um, turned me into a, at least a half-decent network researcher. So thank you very much. <laughs>